Thank you for joining us on H360 Live. My name is Dave Dubin, and I am alive and kicking. Alongside me, as always, Cortland Long from Healthio360. Okay. Joining us today, we have Dr. Thomas Weber from the Colon Cancer Challenge Foundation. Always good to have you. Thank we you. have a very exciting show for you today and a lot of topics to discuss. Let's jump right in. So we have uh, trending on Healthio360. We have a guy named uh, Dave Nichols. Talk to me. Mm -hmm. Dave Nichols is a member on Healthio360. Um, we did a 360 interview series with mm -hmm. him, in fact. He is a three-time cancer survivor. He originally had mouth cancer, defeated that, was diagnosed with leukemia, defeated that, most recently has overcome prostate cancer. Seriously? Seriously. He was, in fact, um, given an award by his doctor for having the largest prostate tumor his doctor has ever seen. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. The largest prostate tumor his doctor has ever seen. Indeed. And he gets an award for that? He got an award for it. I think he's worthy of an award. He's very worthy of an award. Maybe a plaque? Could be a plaque. I think it was a glass plaque. Did he get a mug? Not a mug, okay. unfortunately. We'll work on that. However, so Dave now uh, lives in upstate New York with mm -hmm. his lovely wife. He is a custom pearl inlayer for Martin Guitars. Cool. Very cool. Um, he has not only done the pearl inlay for such notable people as Steven Tyler, Johnny Cash, ZZ Top, Cash. but he's also done the custom pearl inlay on the Our Human Spirit guitar that we asked him to do, and we are going to be auctioning that off um, sometime over the year. Right. So um, we're really I've excited. I've seen that. You've seen it? That's it's impressive. It's really nice looking. Uh, um, I look forward to that. Yeah, so it's we're going to raise money for charity with that guitar. We're uh -huh. really excited for it as a project. And, you know, Dave, he's really phenomenal because no matter everything that he's gone through in life, he still has the most positive outlook I've ever seen. So anything gets him down, he just gets right back up. Could be a Dave thing. It could be a Dave thing. Could I know a, a few thing. like that. Yes. Mm -hmm. he, he also plays? He does play. He's mm -hmm. in a bluegrass band. Um, and he plays with his wife as well. She plays the upright bass. It's bigger than her. Big piece of equipment. Big. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Very cool. Yeah. I like that. So we also have Lauren. She's a member. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. We also have Lauren. Um, we did another 360 interview series with her as well. Right. She is 32 years old, and she was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis at age 26. Wow. Um, she started noticing some of the symptoms, and she knew that these were symptoms because her mother has multiple sclerosis. Mm. And so she was talking to her mom about it, and her mom says that, you know, she had a feeling right away that it was going to be multiple sclerosis. Okay. Lauren had an MRI, and it came back that this is what she has. So she still suffers from um, fatigue. However, she does better in warmer weather, so I know she's pretty excited for spring and summer right around the I think corner. we all are. Yeah, yeah. definitely. <laughs> So that story's on 8360 as it's well. It's on Healthio 360. I think we have about four videos of hers up, and mm -hmm. we have many more to come. So we're really excited to see her story unfold. Let's get some videos of her in warm weather. I think yeah. uh, we'll all be a lot happier. That would be that. nice. Cool. Mm -hmm. uh, Beverly Hyman Feed. I love that name. You know that. Yes. I, I could say that over and over again. It's a very notable name. Would you like name. me to say it over and over again? I think I'm okay. Okay. Good. <laughs> we have some material to get through on Miss Beverly. Sorry. So. She is, uh, speaking of Our Human Spirit, she's an Our Human Spirit Award recipient. Mm -hmm, cool. um, she is fantastic. She's a cancer survivor. She was diagnosed with seven large tumors in her abdomen. And like many people we know, told to get her affairs in order straight away. We've all heard that story. However, she's also a very positive woman, and she was determined to not let that be the case. And she has um, overcome cancer. She's cancer-free today. She's also a frequent speaker on cancer, mm -hmm. and I believe she also talks about alternative treatments for cancer because that was a big part of her treatment. Now, this treatment took place years ago, yes? Years ago. Like mm -hmm. Before this whole personalized medicine, before alternative treatments were trendy. Yes. Um, I understand she has a book? She does have a book. She co-authored a book with her um, granddaughter. I'm pretty sure she co-authored it with her. And it's called Nana, What is Cancer? It's all about talking to young children about cancer and putting it in terms that children can understand. So this was probably from conversations that took place 15 years ago. Definitely. Right, yeah. and, and now her granddaughter or mm -hmm. is obviously 
whether a teenager or significantly older now, that's great. Yeah. Um, and she's an artist? Yes, she's an artist. So she um, has a blog that we also feature on our site, and it's called Aging in High Heels. And it features other notable woman, women. I was going to write that. Oh, were you? Yes. She beat you to the punch. She did beat me to it. I'll, I'll, I'll it. <laughs> so it features other notable women um, who are also artists or in the healthcare field. And it also features some of her artwork as well. It's really inspiring. Does it have various types of heels? Um, there are not very many photos of high heels on it. No. No. Not so yet. then I can still do my book. You can still do it, definitely. Because right, that was going to be my theme. Oh, okay. Well, so totally different. Thanks. All right. So now, uh, light it up blue. So something's yeah. coming up in April. Something is coming up in April. April is Autism Awareness Month. And April 2nd is Light It Up Blue, where about 5,000 buildings globally light it up blue uh, to bring awareness to autism. And in fact, the Empire State Building gets lit up blue. You know right. how they have all the lights around, so they have all... I've never seen it. Never seen it? No, You're I missing out. Yeah, I know. You gotta get out more. I do get out more. <laughs> so it's all blue on April 2nd. I make it a point not to look up. Oh, okay. You're always <laughs> looking it's down. It's a thing. No, not down. Just not up. Well, you're missing out on some stuff. Well, maybe um, I'll start looking up then. Okay. Yeah, then you'll see it lit up blue for Autism Awareness Day. And now, I'm reading here that the space station. The space station. Yeah. I didn't personally see it, but I hear that it was lit up blue. You'll definitely have to look up for that. I yeah. may have to look up for that one or <laughs> watch TV. Uh, now, are these lights synchronized? Do they flash, glow, blink, anything? Um, I'm Do they spell sure out a big word? On the Empire State Building, they are constant. Okay. However, on um, certain um, buildings around the world, they are displayed differently. So the logo for Autism Speaks, you know, is a puzzle piece um, right. at one of the great Buddha statues around the world, and I'm not remembering where it is exactly, but they do put blue lights in the puzzle piece logo formation on the stairs leading up to the Buddha. Well, we're going to have to take a look at it because that sounds really cool. It does. Yeah, if we can get them all to blink in sequence. That would be awesome. Then I'm in. Mm -hmm. um, but I will look up at the Empire State Building Good. this time and, and maybe frequently. Good, you should. Just for you. It's really neat. And, and you. Is that all right? Absolutely. All right, so you, uh, you were a busy guy this month. Yes. Uh, I understand uh, March has not finished yet. No, uh, <laughs> it's not over till it's, it's not, over. It's not over. Uh, so uh, I'm going to give you your credentials. That way you know what they are because the viewers at home need to know this. Dr. Weber is the founder of the Colon Cancer Challenge Foundation. Thank you. And a professor of surgery at, it, but you don't have to thank me. I mean, it's here. Um, uh, surgery at the University of New York, at, uh, downstate. Yes, sir. Right. Estimated number of people projected to be diagnosed with colon or rectal cancer, or and or rectal cancer, I guess, in the U.S. is over 140,000. Correct. That's a lot of people. Mm -hmm. An estimated number of people projected to die from colon or rectal cancer this year is over 50,000. Yeah. What do you think about that? I think it's, uh, it's a tragedy that's largely preventable. So that's why the foundation, along with the many of our partners, is really focused on promoting awareness of the disease and promoting awareness of the, uh, the beauty of being screened. Because, it is uh, a beauty. Yeah, most of this uh, can absolutely be prevented, and that's a fact. So the whole term screening comes into play. Absolutely. So ages? Well, as some of your listeners will know, the American Cancer Society and other professional societies recommend that for the general population, we start screening at age 50. Right. But as you and I have discussed many times, mm -hmm. if you have a positive family history, particularly first degree relative who's been affected, and that would be parent, sibling, God forbid, child, okay. uh, then uh, the recommendation is to start at age 40. And if multiple folks are affected, uh, then 10 years earlier than the earliest case in your family. So it's really important to talk about family history. And I understand African Americans, even without family history, age 45. Yes, the American Society of Gastroenterologists has uh, taken the lead on that and recommend uh, starting at age 45 because uh, there does certainly seem to be an increased uh, incidence at earlier ages. Mm -hmm. So that's extremely important. Now, uh, obviously, I'm not going to say obviously, but not obviously, but uh, with all of the traditional colon cancer awareness events that take place, uh, whether it's 5K runs, uh, events, uh, 
you did something different this year. We did. Sounds kind of cool. We were very fortunate to be able to work with our partners and colleagues at Memorial Sloan Kettering mm -hmm. to host the nation's first summit on young adult colorectal cancer, right. which uh, is definitely an increasing problem. Okay. Uh, with some very dramatic increases over the last 20 to 30 years in the incidence of colorectal cancer in people under the age of 50 and uh, disturbingly, uh, particularly rectal cancer. I understand the percentages are going up pretty much ratcheted every year for like 20 years. Yeah, it is, uh, you know, we'll I'm sure get into the details of some of our uh, guest speakers at the summit, but uh, Rebecca Segal from the American Cancer Society did a beautiful job of showing exactly what you said, that uh, we are talking two to three percent a year for the last 24, 25 years, and it's continuing, just as you said. So in the most recent data, we're still looking at a two percent increase per year in the incidence. So, you know, this is a, this is a serious problem that uh, we, don't, we don't understand. We don't understand. No. But we're going to. Well, I mean, that, that's, <laughs> that's, you know, uh, I, I guess it goes back to the original premise of screening saves, but now we're trying to reach a younger audience because they're the ones that are going up. But I understand the older population, or forgive me for calling it older, but the over 50 population has kind of plateaued in terms of percentages or? Yeah, numbers. well, incidence actually is, uh, is decreasing. So it's a good thing. Yeah. The I word has gotten to them. Absolutely. If you will. Yeah, and the most likely explanation uh, is that uh, the screening and surveillance strategies have definitely started to kick in. So there's no question uh, that that's contributing to the decreased incidence for folks over 50. That's good. But if I may, you know, one interesting and important thing is that when we actually look at the real numbers, we still see some of these increases in the 50 to 54 age group, which underscores something you and I have talked about, which is, you know, we're not, we're not effectively following our own recommendations. So there are people age 50 to age 55 who, for whatever reasons, are not getting screened. And so we're still seeing this may I say, biological effect of these increasing rates because, because the recommended screenings are not kicking in. So, so I share this to just underscore, there's an enormous opportunity here to save lives if we focus initially on just following our own recommendations, doing what's already out there. Well, would I be wrong in saying that the, as you alluded to, the 50 to 55 population, um, to an extent can almost be categorized as the under 50 because it, I guess we're still not reaching them. It's the, the first time screeners, I guess you would call them, yeah. uh, are still Absolutely. not there yet. Yeah, so that's the bad news. The good news is, you know, everything is set to really help out and make a difference. In other words, the recommendations are there, right. the professionals know the data, right. the insurance companies God bless them, are, are set to go. They have their role. Are set to go. Mm -hmm. So really, you know, we really could save a lot of lives if we just followed our own, our own rules and regs. So who was at the summit? Well, the summit uh, was really exciting on many levels because it brought together clinicians who have been leaders in this field, scientists, but also uh, a fairly unique thing, it brought together survivors. And so a big part of the, uh, the construct, a big part of the whole idea was, yes, we had the scientists and the doctors presenting all their latest information, which was absolutely terrific, right. but we also had the survivors there, and uh, we had multiple sessions where the survivors could speak to their own experience, their difficulties with getting people to take them seriously, right. make a diagnosis, organize treatment that took into account you know, their young age, uh, execute that diagnosis, and then uh, get support and assistance to secure a quality of life following those treatments, some of which are quite dramatic, as you and our viewers will know. Sure. So that allowed a 
a discussion, which I think is a fairly novel thing between the survivor community and the people doing the research, and really help to set some of the priorities. And I have to tell you, more than one of the presenters who were more in the basic science community said to me afterwards, they said, you know, we never, ever get to meet with patients. You know, it's not, it's not our job. You know, we're in our laboratories, we're doing this, we're doing that. And I think it made a real impression on them. And I think it was great for the survivors to see that there's a community of people out there whose job it is to try and understand what is going on. I, I think it's good for people to feel like they have a voice. Um, Absolutely. And, and to share. Absolutely. Because it, it, to some, you know, it can be a real release and a real therapeutic Absolutely. Uh, component to healing. Um, not just the physical nature, so it, Absolutely. that's great. And, and the dialogue that can take place uh, in that type of forum, I think. Right, and build, build a sense of community and, and uh, if not u unique, certainly fairly novel, build a, a community that in, in, is inclusive of the people trying to understand the data, trying to come up with new research strategies, trying to come up with better ways to take care of folks, and, and they're there in a room with the folks <laughs> who are being taken care of and have things to say. So it, it, was, it was exciting. So uh, any particular takeaways? action items from there? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, there was a lot of material, as you know, and... Uh, to digest, so to speak. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Dave. And, uh, but seriously, uh, a wide range of risk factors, uh, as we've discussed, the usual suspects, all right, so issues to do with diet, obesity, exercise, mm -hmm. Um, high calorie beverage drinks, decrease incidence. This is all just water on Healthy 360. That's all we drink. Yeah, um, and uh, those sorts of issues. Uh, so we want to really construct as accurate as possible a risk profile. All the factors that have uh, are evidence based shown to be at issue because we can do that then we can articulate risk reduction strategies that we can, we can share with everyone. So that, that's one side. The other really big thing that I know you're familiar with is we heard story after story of people who just were not taken seriously and they had major symptoms. Typically the younger people. Absolutely, and I, I know you're very familiar with this. So, um, that is another opportunity for us to facilitate education both for consumers, patients, and providers. Mm -hmm. So we're looking forward to working with our professional societies, with our, our frontline primary care providers to give them a heads up. You know, if, uh, if someone has persistent changes in bowel habit, uh, certainly if they have rectal bleeding, these things need to be taken very, very seriously. We are talking 14,000 cases a year, right? So, so cases of, of colorectal cancer in people under age 50. Gotcha. So, so there's a couple ways to look at that. It's not insignificant. Well, some people will say, well, 14,000, yeah, that's important, but you know, the total burden, as you mentioned, is over 140,000 cases. But okay. let's keep it in perspective. 14,000 cases a year, that's more than all acute lymphocytic leukemia in this country all Hodgkin's lymphoma in this country, all uterine cancer in this country. So... Not you, combined, but all. Not combined, right. but, you know, if you look at them separately, right. by far. So, you know, this is, this is a very serious issue that's uh, affecting young people in our nation, and there's a lot we can do. We just have to get focused and lead the way lead the way forward. So do you think there's going to be another summit? Well, we're very excited. Uh, certainly our s Memorial Sloan Kettering hosts seem to be very pleased and they're already talking to us about next year. Okay. Uh, Maybe other parts of the country? I think that's definitely something to think about. And um, also we will be working on uh, setting up working groups that will delve into this uh, in more detail. And uh, another major project 
uh, will be to work with the survivor community to develop surveys to, again, document what their concerns are, but also start to look at some of these risk factor issues. Again, as you and I have discussed, you know, our great national cancer registries, you know, MCI, CDC, do a terrific job of tracking cancer in our country, but they are not designed or resourced to really get to the next level. They're not collecting information about family history. They're yeah. certainly not collecting information about BMI. Right. They're certainly not collecting information about activity, all these other issues, tobacco use per se. These inferences are based on other studies of other populations that we then filter back to look at the colon cancer issue. It's not primary information per se going into these registries to help guide research. So, so for our epidemiological colleagues to really help us understand what's going on, we need to work on that and we need to get our own primary sources of information going. And, and there are some reasons why? Well, yes, they are now. <laughs> okay, well, that's a good thing. It's just a week ago, but yes. Uh, I mean, it, it's a step. And we look forward to working with our HealthEO uh, viewers right. and our, our larger community to help us help us fashion that, guide it, inform it, right. and uh, help us move it forward. It takes a lot of people playing in the sandbox. Absolutely. With but sometimes egos and silos of information that are tough to crack. Yeah, but uh, you know, a terrific thing being there was uh, just seeing that there were lots of folks from all kinds of different organizations, and in fact, uh, you know, the Never Too Young Coalition was there, and that is a group that represents over 30 organizations that's focused on this problem, right. and they've been terrific, right. and they even had their, their regular uh, quarterly meeting the day before the summit. They came to New York to do it. They could have met anywhere in the United States. They came to New York so that they were there. Well, there is a bit of a draw. There is. Thank you. You mean David Dubin? <laughs> Tom Weber. <laughs> and Corlett. <laughs> they and the Empire State Building. Yeah. yeah now indeed. that I look up. Mm -hmm. They came. They did. So that they could be there. So you, I, I think You built it and they came. I think this speaks well for uh, collaborative work in the future. Does, Colon things. cancer is definitely one of those fields where it seems like everybody's very willing to work together. Having gone to a lot of colon cancer awareness events this month, you know, it was yeah. really phenomenal to see so many different groups yeah. who all have their own organizations but right. coming together. I think there's tremendous uh, synergy and, and collaboration and, you mm -hmm. know, this, I think this month, I think you're right, we could really see that everywhere we went. You yeah. know, everyone was, everyone was there. The Alliance is working with Fight Colorectal Cancer, is working with the Colon Cancer Challenge Foundation, is working with the folks in the Colander, and, and many other organizations that I apologize for not mentioning specifically, but I agree with you. Everyone is engaged. Mm -hmm. It's such a compelling problem. Yeah. I think, um, especially something like the summit, where you have the survivors interacting with the physicians, yeah. geneticists, yeah. Uh, you can have a conversation that can lead to that type of cooperation. Because mm -hmm. uh, I do think, uh, in the colon cancer case especially, that the survivors are, are driving the teamwork. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Because um, there's just, I, I think there's this perspective that um, I, I don't care about egos. Uh, right. I don't care about stepping on toes. Um, there's just no time for it. There's no room right. for it. Right. So it's going to happen regardless. You can either join us or you can get in the way. Yeah. And I think so far that's been a whole lot of joining us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you, uh, the Colon Cancer Challenge Foundation, obviously did a lot of great work last month, uh, this month still. Yes. Uh, anything you want to share from the foundation? Uh, any takeaways? Anything different that we need to know? Well, You're welcome. you know, we're, we're very, very excited that the summit uh, was a success. So we're going right. to continue to invest in that. Uh, we're going to continue to work with all of our other partners to promote awareness, mm -hmm. uh, and particularly of the effectiveness of uh, screening. Right. And, uh, you know, we really, we really want to continue to leverage the information we have to work with the provider community to really facilitate access to screening for everyone. You know, we've made a lot of progress, but yes. coming 360, if you will, <laughs> we're good. still talking over 140,000 cases a year yep. and 50,000 largely preventable deaths. So while we're all slapping each other on the back, 
we still have a long way to go. Well, I think slapping each other on the back is fine, too. I think uh, so much progress has yeah. been made. Yeah. Um, but the numbers are still the numbers. Yeah. And that's something we can work on. Absolutely. Good stuff. Thank you. Uh, we do have swag, too. Oh. You know that since you're on the show, you Wonderful. can get the, uh, the healthy OC six. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank uh, you. You can wear one on each wrist, or you <laughs> can share with a friend, or yeah. you can wear one on each wrist. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Well, that's going to be our show for the week. You know that. Okay. So okay. Is that okay? That's terrific. You sure? Thank you. You okay yeah. with that? All right. So anyway, that is going to be our show for this week. Uh, obviously, I would like to thank our guest, Dr. Weber, from the Colon Cancer Challenge Foundation for joining thank us you. today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I would like to thank the viewership and members at home, as always, for joining us. Uh, remember, all of our episodes can be viewed anytime on demand at HealthyO360.com. And HealthyO360 can be found on uh, Facebook. Yes. Right? That's a website. Very popular. Uh, Instagram, which is one of my favorites. Twitter, and that also famous Pinterest. Don't forget to use the hashtag real stories when posting. So on behalf of Corbin Long, as always, and everyone here at HealthyO360, we do thank you for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you again next week. I am David Dubin. I am Alive and Kicking. And we are going to leave you today with a song from Dave Nichols called Beyond the Rain. When the skies are getting dark And the clouds are turning gray and the storms of life have filled our hearts with pain if we let our savior in if we put our trust in him he will lead us beyond the rain beyond the rain there'll be no more dying no more crying no more pain when we put our lives in the hand of Jesus he will lead us beyond the rain now the battle has been won God sent his only son to fulfill the promise of his name if only we believe, oh, what a gift we will receive to live with Jesus beyond the rain. Beyond the rain, there'll be no more dying, no more crying, no more pain when we put our lives in the hand of Jesus, he will lead us beyond the rain. Beyond the rain, there'll be no more dying, no more crying, no more pain. When we put our lives in the hand of Jesus, he will lead us beyond the rain. Yes, he will lead us beyond.